Good afternoon, and welcome to our FREA conversation regarding the basics of Medicare. My name is John Green, and I'm joined by your president, Edwina Williams, and I want to thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And we're just a couple of housekeeping details before we hear from Edwina and going to then talk about Medicare and all the alphabet soup that goes along that. All participants are in a listen only mode. And what that means is, is you've got a question or you want to make a comment, feel free to drop it into chat. Feel free to drop it into the Q&A section and we can pause. And if it's something that the, the whole group would uh, benefit from, we can answer it out loud. And then at the end of the conversation, what we'll do is we'll stop the recording and we will go out and uh, answer some questions live if you want to do that as opposed to type it in there. Speaking of recording, we do record every one of these sessions. We put them out on the FREA website. That way you can go back and reference it at a later point, share it with your friends, talk with your spouse, whatever. And so uh, we are appreciative that you're here today. You'll also notice there's a QR code down in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. This works just like the QR codes in restaurants, wherever we uh, look at menus, you just take your smartphone, you open up your camera feature, hover over that QR code, a little form will come up and you'll hit it and all that kind of stuff. That's the best way to get more information that you hear about today. Have someone talk to you about it, review what your FREA benefits are as well. So uh, grab a pen and paper. We're gonna take some notes today because I wanna give you some things. I wanna let you spell out some alphabet stuff, talk about some important numbers and things like that as well. But uh, since we have Edwina and Harriet with us today, I appreciate both of you ladies joining us today. Edwina, tell us what's going on with the FREA now that you're uh, now that you're the president and Harriet's uh, coming beside you as well. Well, we have an amazing team that is gung ho and is busy rewriting our handbook. We're uh, prepping for our upcoming symposiums that will start in August in October. And uh, we've just been very busy. Uh, we just returned from a trip to Washington, D.C where we met our counterparts across the United States at the uh, NRTA 75th celebration. So we've been very busy and involved with uh, NRTA as well as um, AARP. So here we are, we're excited to continue to work for our membership and uh, I'm excited about these webinars. I'm having a little problem saying Wednesday webinar uh, Wednesday <laughs> Wisdom webinars, but I'm going to get all my W's in place before it's all over with. Thank you. You. you bet. I appreciate that. Is there anything from a legislative uh, situation that we need to be looking out for this fall going into the election period? Well, we're hoping that um, legislatively we have a uh, group of legislators that wish to continue our pensions. We're very concerned about that in Florida. Uh, we've gone through a, a recent change where the districts that hire a person and put them into the um, uh, kind of like the 401k plan, right. the district itself has to come up with an additional 3% because um, they have discovered that the um, uh, defined um, contribution plans? Yes, are not performing as well as the pension plan, which is the defined benefit plan. So um, it's, um, it's beginning to hit home in the legislation. And we know many states have gone to the, def uh, the defined uh, contribution plan, which is really the 401k type plan. And they have tried to come back to a pension plan because they find that that works a lot better on helping to maintain teachers in their jobs as well as, um, you know, paying out more after a person retires. So we're hoping that um, they will stay with us and, uh, and continue to support our pension plan. Um, and and if, you know, if it's not broke, why fix it? That's the question. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you very much. Like I said, we've passed 10,000 members in FREA. This is the time to use your strength in numbers and your voice. So if you're not signed up for these legislative calls to action, text to 81411, text FREA members to 81411. You'll get text responses back whenever it's time to 
move on a legislative issue. Use your new voice, use your expanded grown voice into, uh, to make this an opportunity to protect those teacher pensions out there. And it's so important for that. So Edwina, thank you very much for sharing with us what's going on. Uh, we're excited about these Wednesday Wisdom webinars as well, moving from Manic Monday to Wednesday Wisdom. And I hope this works out for everyone as a part of your day. And we've got a pretty good calendar the rest of the year. Real quickly, my name is John Green. I work with Association Member Benefits Advisors. I was with you back in the, the early summer at your convention, which I love doing that. I appreciate that. Live a little bit north of Houston with my wife, who is a second grade elementary school teacher, teaches in the same school that she went to and my three kids went to. When we're not in Texas, we are down there with you in Central Florida, visiting family and visiting the, the mouse. But for the better part of my 30 plus year career, I have spent in classrooms helping educators understand what their retirement years are like. So I appreciate the opportunity to spend some time with you today tackling this conversation about Medicare and some of the other topics we're going to tackle throughout the fall as well. Just a quick reminder, and Ed went ahead on this because it's so important. Your association does so much for you. Being that pension watchdog is first and foremost. Many of you worked all of your career and worked hard and making sure that pension is there for you, any potential opportunities for COLAs, anything like that. Being a pension watchdog is the number one reason FREA is there for you. Also to preserve any type of benefits that you may have earned, whether it be from the school district, from the state, keeping you connected. It was so good to be back together. Um, so good to be back together with your local units as well and keeping you uh, connected. And what I loved seeing was so many of the adopt a school, the book drive activities, the things that you're doing to give back to those educators who are now have filled your shoes once you left the schoolhouse. And then to partner with benefit providers, to provide you some exclusive benefits, discounts, fun stuff, free stuff, plus the education that goes on during this time period as well. That's what FREA does for you and the 10,000 plus other members of FREA. Let's continue to grow this and make those things stronger for you as well. We are as a company, if you're not familiar with, with AMBA, Association Member Benefits Advisors, we are all across the state, all across the nation. We're relatively new into Florida. Our role is to help drive membership to the association and then to come in and help provide benefits and benefit reviews of all the benefits that FREA provides for their members. We've broken the state down into three sections. Eric Cannon, Alexander Williams, and Sam Palett are our district managers responsible for different districts within the state of Florida. Alexander Williams, which you're very familiar with, oftentimes joins me on these webinars. He is on his honeymoon this week, and so he sends his regrets. I don't think he sends too many regrets because he's enjoying his honeymoon, but we're uh, we're happy for him and hope to have him back on some of our future webinars. But you've seen Alexander at many of your unit meetings and at the convention as well. So we are here to serve you and here to help you grow your membership, but also to help you connect those benefits that you've earned and that you have access to through FREA and AMBA. These are benefits that maybe you didn't keep whenever you left the schoolhouse. They're not covered by any type of benefits that you may have gotten through COBRA or through the state they're portable for whatever reason that you leave the state. Many people come to Florida to retire. Many Floridians, they'll retire closer to their grandkids all across the country. These benefits are not tied to any networks in the state. You can take them wherever you wanna go. You can also extend your benefits from FREA to your parents or to adult children who have maybe um, aged out of any benefits that you have, something like that. And we find many teachers will retire, but they don't quit working. They'll work part-time somewhere else or take on another full-time job, but they still may have responsibility for a loved one. That if something happened to them through a parent or through a, an adult child, that if they had to take time off from work to care for them, it could put a financial burden on themselves. So there's plans that you can have in place that can take care of those needs so you don't have to worry about your uh, needing to take extended time off or stunning your income growth as well. So but today, our, our goal in this conversation is to talk about some of the Medicare and Social Security changes that took place this year, talk really about the myths and realities of Medicare and insurance and what it pays and doesn't pay, show you some of those costly gaps, and explain and demystify some of the concept of supplements, what I need to do, when I need to do it, and all that kind of stuff. But help me understand who's on the call today. I want to launch a quick poll. 
And I want you to tell us if you're already a Medicare participant, you're not eligible for Medicare yet, or you're not sure if you're eligible for Medicare yet. So if you'll answer that quiz or that, uh, that poll, it'll kind of help me direct my conversation to be a little bit better informed so that I can point out to you things you have to do depending upon your age and things that you need to be aware of if you're already a member of Medicare. Because this time of year, you're starting to get bombarded. So we'll let that open for just a couple more seconds there. And I think we've got just about everybody. So we'll end this poll right now. So we are right at about a 70-30 split. Okay, so most of you are already a Medicare participant. And that's good because I'm going to break down some things for you, show you what Medicare does and doesn't cover, help demystify a few things. And for those of you that are on Med not yet on Medicare, I'm going to show you some steps that you need to take to make sure that you don't get penalized and make sure that you understand how this works with any other type of insurance that you may have as well. So thank you for uh, participating in that poll. Let's go ahead and uh, jump right on in and talk about Social Security. For those of you who are already on Social Security and already taking your Social Security, you know that you got a nice little cost of living increase back at the first of the year, averaged to about 90 something dollars a month, which is not chump change at all. But when I went in and started doing some research on the cost of living increase, I found that over the past decade, cost of living increases have gone up about 18 to 19%. But the Part B premiums for Medicare that come out of your pocket have gone up over 55%. And they did jump again this year, up about $21 to $170 a month compared to $148 last year. So no matter how much our Social Security goes up, we find that Medicare Part B premiums continue to go up even more so. And so you need to be aware of that if you're not yet drawing Social Security or you're not yet eligible for Medicare, however that works out, that just because we get cost of living increases doesn't mean that some of that's not going to get eaten up by Part B Medicare premiums. Some other things that Medicare took place this year in terms of the Part D prescription plan, the donut hole or the gap in coverage that you're responsible for widened just a little bit more by $300. The deductible that you have to go out of pocket went up $35, now $480 before that you get coverage. So depending upon the type of medications you're on, if you have a Part D plan, you're going to see these changes as well. So we all know inflation is impacting us quite a bit, no matter whether you go to the grocery store, gasoline, whatever it is, it's also impacting us in the type of benefits that we receive here. On the flip side, though, Medicare has been making cuts. It doesn't matter the administration in, in, uh, in power, it doesn't matter who controls Congress. They've put these cuts in for the past 10 plus years shaving off billions and billions of dollars in the way they provide services back to hospitals, reimbursement rates, what they cover, and what they don't cover. And this is on top of increases to premiums, deductibles, co-insurance clauses, and things like that. And how this really works out, we're gonna talk about it in more depth at the end, but I wanna show you just one way this impacts an FREA member. So for the past eight years, Grace has been receiving immune therapy treatments to boost her immune system after a cancer diagnosis and treatment about eight years ago. It's to prevent that cancer recurrence. So she's been going to a local physician's clinic, receiving that treatment from the friendly faces that she's known over the past eight years. What Medicare comes in and they do is they'll shave small fractional percentages off the reimbursement rate that they'll provide for those clinics for certain medications. It could be one or 2% here or there. Doesn't seem like a lot. It's a big when you put it on the scale across the country, but for the doctor providing that coverage or providing that medicine, that small cut may make that procedure and that medication a loss for them. They can no longer provide that service. So the physician's clinic chooses to stop providing that particular service and that puts Grace at a lurch. That means that she has to either decide to pay for it out of her pocket, stay close to home with that physician's clinic she, that she's comfortable with, or she has to travel to a new clinic and find someone that takes Medicare. So you can see how these little tiny cuts can make a big impact on an individual. So I want you to think about this in terms of what Medicare doesn't cover and what it does cover as we go through here and talk about this. But before we jump into all the alphabet soup of Medicare, every year 
your Medicare premiums, your Part B premiums that you have to pay for, are based on your annual income as a household. And if you had a life-changing event last year or this year, such as getting married or getting a divorce or your spouse pass away, you have the chance to apply to have your Medicare premiums reduced. You would use form SSA 44, which is a Medicare income related monthly adjustment amount form that says, I had a spouse pass away. I stopped working full time. I had a secondary home that was a rental home on the coast and it got blown away in a hurricane and I can't use it to drive income anymore. So I've lost X number of thousands of dollars. When those things happen, you can apply to reduce your Medicare costs, your out-of-pocket premium for Part B by a certain amount, but you've got to file that form. So if one of those things happened to you, you had a life change, or next year you have a life change, do it now because it can reduce your premiums now, not having to wait until your, uh, your actual social, your uh, tax filing time next year. So now let's jump into Medicare. So grab a pen. We're going to talk about how Medicare works for you, what you've got to sign up for, is this all I need during my retirement years? That type of stuff. What is Medicare? What do I see on TV? Stuff like that. So for those of you, for the 30% the of you that do not qualify for Medicare yet, you're not eligible yet, you have a small window. I don't say small, but it, it's a window that you need to apply through SSA.gov, the Social Security Administration. Whether you're taking Social Security or not, you need to apply for Medicare Part A and Part B when a seven-month window, three months prior to your 65th birthday, your 65th birthday month, or three months after. You've got that seven-month window to apply for Medicare around your 65th birthday. If you don't do it, forget to do it, think, well, I've got coverage through my spouse, I don't need Medicare, you could pay a penalty for not doing so. OK, so it's important that no matter what type of coverage you have, be it through a spouse who's younger than you, older than you, still working, has full coverage, whatever, you still have to apply during a seven month window around your birthday, your 65th birthday, to apply for Parts A and Part B of Medicare. OK, to SSA.gov is where you want to start that process. Once you start that process, you have some decisions to make. So you've got kind of a decision flow here. Part A, and we're going to cover what parts A and part B cover, all the alphabet soup, don't worry about that. Part A, you're going to get, I don't want to say for free because you've been paying into Medicare all of your career, but part A has no premium involved in it. You get that automatically once you apply for it through SSA.gov. Part B has a premium, and you saw it's $170 for most individuals, your Part B coverage. I'll show you what that means in a moment as well. So even if you already have coverage or if you've got coverage through a spouse or something like that, once you turn 65 in that seven-month window, you'll need to apply for Parts A and Part B for Medicare. Some people, if they are taking out their Social Security already at that point, that B will just be deducted from your Social Security. Some of you who may be delaying your Social Security payments till after 65, you'll have to pay for Part B out of your bank account, set it up for payment, however you want to do that. You'll have to do that before your Social Security checks start coming whenever you decide to take that. Then you'll have some decisions to make. And we're going to walk you through those decisions and show you how each one is a little bit different, but how they're all the same so that you don't have to worry about, am I making the right decision or not? And that's what AMBA and FREA have done on your behalf to make sure that you've got the best endorsed solutions out there. Okay, so let's talk about Part A coverage. Now, Part A coverage, as I mentioned, is something you don't have to pay for. It's already been taken out of your paychecks over the years when you were paying in on your Medicare. Part A is your hospitalization coverage. So think about everything related to a hospital visit, accident, surgery, emergency, whatever it is. It's your hospital care. It's your skilled nursing care and your short-term nursing care. We're going to really break that down because Medicare defines that very tightly, and I don't want you to be misconstrue what could be out there. Some home health services, 
your end of life care in a hospice situation. It pays for a semi-private room in the hospital and meals and general nursing medications as part of your inpatient care, not your prescription meds after the fact, not for prescription meds that are like ongoing maintenance medication, things like that. So all of your things related to hospitals are covered under part A. What's not covered under part A are your doctor visits. Any type of true long-term care for skilled nursing, anything private related. So if you want private rooms, if you want rooms with TVs, if you want rooms with a window with a view, if you want rooms with, you know, that they bring all your personal socks and care and all this kind of stuff like that, it doesn't cover that. There's other places in Medicare that cover some of that. So really your part A is just your hospitalization coverage. Again, that doesn't cost you a dime. You've already paid for those things throughout your working career, but you do have to sign up for it, okay? Then you jump in and part B. This is the part, again, you have to sign up for, regardless of whether you have coverage anywhere else, through your district, through a spouse, through private coverage, whatever it is, if you have coverage anywhere else, you still have to sign up for part B. Because once you turn 65, Medicare becomes the primary provider. Your other health insurance is secondary or supplemental, okay? Part B covers your outpatient care, your doctor visits, home health care, that durable medical equipment like your, your walkers, your wheelchairs, sometimes CPAP machines, things like that. Those things are part of that, plus your preventative services, your well care visits, your mammograms, things of that nature. That's your Part B coverage. Part A hospitalization, Part B, outpatient physician and preventative care. What's not covered by B is your prescription medications. Again, if it's inpatient care as a result of a surgery or something like that, that's covered under Part A. If it is your uh, ongoing maintenance medication for diabetes, high blood pressure, things like that, that's either Part D or private pay, something of that nature. It doesn't care for skilled nursing coverage. And we'll talk about that because, again, this whole concept of long-term care, home health, uh, care for skilled nursing, those type of things, not covered by Part B, neither hearing, dental, or vision, hospice services, or hospital visits. Some of that stuff, again, is covered by A. Some of it's not covered by either one of them. So, again, important to understand what you've got out there. So that's Parts A and Part B, okay? Part A is free. Sign up for it. You get it. Part B. There is a premium. If you are not yet drawing your Social Security, you'll have to pay for that separately. If you are already drawing Social Security, they will just deduct it out of your Social Security payment. Pretty simple. SSA.gov starts the whole process. Here's how Medicare costs work. And really, this isn't that big of a deal for most of you in terms of qualifying. The premiums for Medicare Part A are zero if you've worked 40 quarters. And for all of you out there, and Edwin, I see you nodding, you work probably more than 40 quarters in your lifetime in the schools, you know, so it's Part A is covered for free. Part A deductibles and coinsurance, you have a deductible for each benefit period, depending upon how long it is, you've got $1,500 deductible, plus you've got certain coinsurance clauses throughout that time period that you have for part A for your hospitalization. Again, that's where supplements will cover these things. Part B is $170.10 for everybody except for high earners. So again, if you are considered a high earner and paying more than $170 a month, but you have a lifetime, a lifestyle change because of a life event, you can possibly get that reduced down to that $170 amount there. There are some deductibles and co-pays in part B. You've got, a, these are again for your doctor visits, your well care visits, things like that. $233 per year and a 20% coinsurance clause for all Medicare approved expenses for Part B. So you can see as a standalone Part A and Part B, the care is good, but there are some costs associated. And that's why there are companies that provide Medicare supplements or Medicare Advantage plans. And so we're gonna kind of talk those two things going forward. If you have a medical plan, say a spouse has retiree medical through their corporation, really all you would probably need 
in terms of Medicare is Part A and Part B. If you have no other medical plan, you would then need to look at a supplement or some type of Medicare Advantage plan. So again, Part A and Part B, and then you need to supplement with something, be it a private health care or a supplement plan. So let's jump in and look at the alphabet soup that is Medicare supplement. All right. So you've probably heard at church, down at the golf course, at your favorite coffee shop, oh, I've got a plan A, D, F, G, L, K, M, N, O, P, whatever. You know, you've heard the alphabet soup and it covers this, it covers that, it covers all these different things. I really kind of want to narrow your focus down on what is the most popular two plans. All the other plans, and I want to be very clear about this, and I'll reinforce this a couple of times. Every Medicare supplement plan provided by a provider, if company A or company one, company two, company three offers a plan A, their plan A's are all the same. They're all government mandated plans that require you to cover the exact same thing. So if it's Cigna or Aetna or Health Choice, it doesn't matter. Those plans are the, exactly the same. What you need to look at is what do I want to cover? Because the price can vary. The price can vary on what you want covered. The price can vary on your zip code. It can vary on your age. It can vary on your health conditions, things like that. Most people will choose an F or a G. Now, if you were older than 65 in 2020, January 1st of 2020, you are still eligible to have a plan F. And a plan F, as you can see there, covered 100% of all the deductible and co-insurance clauses, costs, all the excess charges covered 100%. If you have not yet turned 65 or you turn 65 after January 1st of 2020, a plan G is the closest thing that you can get. And really the only thing that you have out there is your $233 Part B deductible. So these are the two most, I would say, rich benefit plans. They are the two most expensive, but they're the two most popular plans. I would highly encourage you to sit down with an AMBER representative. Let them cover what each one of these costs, show you how that works in your zip code, because it's all, like I said, zip code rated based on what you have. These two plans are the most popular across the country because they're kind of the, I have all the bases covered as much as Medicare is going to allow you to cover those bases, okay? So let's kind of show you how this works. So let's recap this alphabet soup. Your part A is the hospital coverage. You have a $1,556 deductible. Your part B is your doctor's office visit coverage. Is it $233 deductible? Medicare will pay 80%. You're responsible for 20%. Once you reach age 65, Medicare is primary regardless of the other coverage that you have. Then you come in with a supplement. And for this case, we're going to assume that individuals that are not yet eligible are under age 65 or you didn't turn 65 before 2020. So the plan G is what you have. Your Part A deductible, that $1,556 deductible, if you have to go to the hospital with a plan G, it's 100% covered, nothing out of your pocket. With Part B, all you're responsible for with the Plan G supplement is that $233 deductible for doctor visits. Plan G pays the remaining 20%. If you, again, were over 65 on January 1st of 2020, you're eligible for a Plan F, and that covers that $233 deductible, so you don't have anything out of pocket in that regards. Again, all supplement plans no matter what you get in the mail, no matter what you see on TV, all Medicare supplement plans are the same, no matter who the provider is, okay? So I want to make that real clear. If there's any questions, feel free to drop them in the chat, put them in the Q&A. We can answer those as we go along as well. So that's a recap on parts A and B, and then how the supplements work. But how many of you have breakfast with these two guys? How many of you have had breakfast with Joe Namath, Jimmy J.J. Walker? You see them on TV all the time talking about call now, free plan. You may get money back. We may throw in dental, vision, Disney World tickets. You never know what we're going to throw in. You know, 
these guys are representing companies that are selling Medicare Advantage plans. Medicare Advantage plans operate a little bit differently. They still operate under the guidelines that Medicare sets out. However, Medicare has tried to transfer their costs to private providers. And so they've allowed Medicare Advantage companies to offer plans that use Medicare billing, coding with some restrictions, but they're private plans that could have some differences in them. And so I want to make sure that you've got this out there. I want to share with you how my mom uses her Medicare Advantage plan. And depending upon your health situation, depending upon what you like and dislike, they may be an option for you. They may be something that you want to consider, but I want to make sure you go in with eyes wide open. And here's why. A Medicare supplement, again, is a true federal government Medicare plan just provided by a private health company. A Medicare Advantage plan is completely provided by a private company that can change what's internally covered in it for less or more, still uses Medicare billing, still uses Medicare procedure codes, things like that. With a Medicare supplement, there's no network. You can go to any doctor that you want to that takes Medicare. Referrals are usually not required. So you don't have to worry about if you need to go see a specialist, you don't have to go see a primary first, you can go straight to a specialist. You'll probably need to get a Medicare Part D drug plan that can run 10, 12 bucks, something like that, depending upon what you're taking. You may pay a higher monthly premium, but you've got no maximum out of pockets. You've got you know, very low deductible. You know what your costs are and how they're controlled. You can change plans at any time. If you decide I don't like XYZ company, I can go to another plan. You may have to qualify health questions. It's not a scary situation. You just have to answer a few questions, goes into your rate. Medicare Advantage plans on the flip side don't provide near as much flexibility. Usually they're in a provider network. And so when Joe Namath and Jimmy JJ Walker are talking, when they're calling you and saying, hey, call me on this phone number, talk about this free plan you get or all these bells and whistles, know that they could be referring you to one of five or 10 or 15 different companies that have different networks. Some of these networks are as small as five doctors. Some of these networks are extremely large, but you've got to use a provider network. You'll have to go, it's kind of like an HMO or a PPO. You've got to go through the referrals for specialists. You usually have uh, your drug coverage is covered in there, depending on what you're taking. They may have a low or a zero uh, premium, but built inside, you could have copays. You could have larger deductibles and you could have a sizable out-of-pocket maximum. So the cost could be more. The biggest thing about these, and this is why you're going to see Joe Namath, Jimmy J.J. Walker, Tom Selleck, all these guys on TV nonstop, you can only make changes in these plans from mid-October to early December. So just know that you're going to get lots and lots of mail, TV bombardment during this time because they want you to find out about these plans. Some plans, again, will throw bells and whistles in there that may or may not be of an advantage to you. But again, you've got to look at the network. You've got to look at the out-of-pocket costs. And I'll share with you that in a moment. Now, I mentioned my mother. My mother is on a Medicare Advantage plan through a pretty large hospital network here in, in Texas. It's a, the hospital that she goes to and the network is right about three miles from her house. So it's very good. She doesn't travel anywhere. So it's all all good coverage from that regards. The thing that she does not like is that the doctors change so frequently in her network. So she's 81 years old. She doesn't like change. And she's had to go to four different doctors in the past two years for her primary care physician. So just know that that's usually her biggest frustration point. She's very healthy. She doesn't have any prescriptions, had no surgeries, you know, nothing major, anything like that. So no health issues. So she doesn't really have to worry about the out-of-pocket expense. Now, as she gets older, she may have to, but there could be an expense there. But for those of you who may have more health issues, you may want to look more at the supplement than the Medicare Advantage side. Again, 
each preference to your own. Pay attention to the out-of-pocket mounts, the, the deductibles, the copays, and the tightness of the network. I've talked to some people to where it is simply a small physician's clinic, and there are just two or three doctors in that network. But their plan sounds great on the phone because you get it all for free. You know, so again, pay attention to that. But companies can change their coverage within that Medicare Advantage plan. Let me show you how this could work. Let's take a 72-year-old female that has the option of going on the Plan G Medicare Supplement or taking a Medicare Advantage plan. Now, remember, in both cases, she has to have Part A and she has to have Part B. So she's already has Part A and paying for Part B. Then she's got to decide, do I have a supplement or do I have a Medicare Advantage plan? She pays for her supplement, $113 a month. There's no premium up front for her Medicare Advantage plan, okay? She has an annual deductible of $233 for that plan G because she's decided that she's gonna take pay a little less and she, she's okay with that deductible. Under a Medicare Advantage plan, she would have had a $1,500 deductible. She has no out-of-pocket expenses beyond that on the Medicare supplement side, but she could have $5,900 out of pocket maximum on the Medicare Advantage side. So when it comes down to it, the maximum, maximum, maximum that she's gonna pay out of her pocket if she goes the supplement route is her monthly premiums plus that small deductible, about $1,600. If something happens to her, she could pay close to $6,000 under the Medicare Advantage plan. Mm -hmm. Medicare Advantage plan has a, the drug coverage included. She could pay for a Part D plan for a small drug coverage if she needs it on the, the other side. So the potential savings, you got $1,700 plus 50, or versus $5,900. It could cost you over $4,000 to have what I call a free Medicare Advantage plan. So it's important if you do explore the Medicare Advantage route, get beyond the bells and whistles, get beyond the it's free to you, that kind of stuff. Explore the out-of-pocket maximums, explore the deductibles, explore the network, that type of thing that you have to, to, to fall in line with. Again, that's what your AMBA representative can do for you. They can sit and go side by side and show this to you individually so that that's a benefit from FREA to you that you have someone that can review your plans, review your options and share with you. And you make the decision say, this may be the best for me or this is the best for me. Again, that's however you want to do that, okay? Any questions about those things, drop them into chat, put them into Q&A. We'll be glad to answer those for you. So we've talked about Medicare parts A, part B, the supplement with the alphabet soup. We've talked about the differences between a supplement and a Medicare Advantage plan. You know when you're supposed to make the decisions on either one of those, when you're eligible versus what the time changes that you can make. Let's go back and touch on the cuts because this is where I really want you to understand Medicare. And this is not only for those of you who are not Medicare eligible yet. This is for those of you who are on Medicare but don't know how it's going to work if you have to go in for a procedure. All these cuts that I showed you before, again, it didn't matter what administration was in power or who owned Congress, which way or the other. They've been going on for the past decade. And here's how they've started to cut some expenses out of Medicare that can really put the cost back on you. This is in the area of how they code medical procedures. The cost of care after a medical procedure is what is escalating astronomically. So Medicare says we can't afford to pay for all that care, all that rehab after surgeries. So we're going to start moving more and more procedures into the outpatient category or the observation status category. And what that really boils down to me is it doesn't change how you receive your treatment, your care, your procedure in the hospital. It only matters what happens after you're discharged out of the hospital. So by doing this, what they do is every year Medicare goes in and says, here are all the procedures that are considered outpatient. Here are all the procedures that are considered inpatient. We're going to take 
another thousand of these inpatient procedures and move them to outpatient procedures. I'm going to show you how that works. It's very insidious. You could have had a knee replacement surgery five years ago, spent three nights in a hospital and had skilled nursing care after that, and it was all covered by Medicare. But now Medicare has changed to where that knee replacement surgery is an outpatient procedure, and you get none of that rehabilitative care after the fact. That's money that's all in your out of your pocket. They're adding more and more procedures all the time. It makes it more and more difficult for us to know where our costs are going to come, but this is how Medicare makes cuts. And this observation status is the key. It is simply a billing code or a billing status designation that hospitals use to bill Medicare. Medicare says that if you have a certain percentage of customers who are patients who receive inpatient care, but then have to be readmitted because of an infection, because they didn't get proper rehabilitation services, we're going to cut your reimbursement rates. Hospitals cannot survive without Medicare reimbursement money. So what hospitals and Medicare have done is they've said, all right, we're going to make these observation status procedures. And that means even if you spend three nights in a hospital, you don't receive any readmittance problems. You don't receive any type of uh, post-care rehabilitative services that are covered by Medicare after the fact. It's all an outpatient procedure. It really saves Medicare a lot of money. It keeps the money flowing to the hospitals. It just puts the financial burden back on us as Medicare recipients. And here's how this works. First of all, it's not going down. Millions and millions of more observation status situations happen in hospitals. That doesn't mean that you are only in and out in a day. You can still spend three nights in the hospital, but you're an outpatient or an observation status, not an inpatient. It affects you in a lot of different ways. Whenever you check into the hospital, they're going to tell you that you're receiving outpatient services and you're not an inpatient because this procedure doesn't qualify for inpatient services. And these observation statuses, these may affect your coverage and what you're responsible for financially. So again, that designation of inpatient versus outpatient is crucial to what Medicare pays and doesn't pay for. Then on top of that, they're going to come in and give you this advanced beneficiary notice of non-coverage that says, if you're an outpatient and Medicare doesn't pay, you're responsible for all of these things, even if your Medicare appointed doctor, your Medicare doctor said you have to stay in the hospital and you need this coverage. If Medicare doesn't cover it, you don't get coverage for it. Again, it's another way that they shave off. Now, I don't want to concern you from the standpoint, you're still going to get the quality of treatment. The surgeries are the same. The procedures, the care in the hospital is going to stay the same. It's all what happens after you leave the hospital, after you, when you need the skilled rehabilitative care, those type of things. That's what Medicare is not covering by the change of this. And so when it comes to Medicare and this concept of skilled nursing care, so you have that hip replacement surgery, that knee replacement surgery, or you fall and break a hip, and you say, all right, I'll spend my time in the hospital, get my surgery repaired, what now do I get? If you are admitted into the hospital as an inpatient and you stay three days, so write down the number three, as an inpatient care, you have some Medicare coverage in a skilled nursing facility for 20 days, 100%. Boom, you're covered 100%, not a problem. After that, if you still need skilled care, you're going to have to pay $194.50 a day. After 100 days, Medicare stops paying. Medicare is not designed for your recovery after 100 days or for any type of chronic care or any skilled care in a long-term care facility. And when they stop paying for nursing home coverage, meaning that you've passed that 100-day mark or you're not going to get better, meaning that you won't be able to dress yourself anymore or feed yourself or walk or something like that, immediately they stop providing coverage 
for any type of care. So I want to make sure that you're aware that long-term care is not a provision of Medicare, and it is usually not a provision of any private health care as well. Supplements won't cover it. The only thing that will cover it is a separate long-term care policy. So now that you understand kind of what Medicare does and doesn't cover, let's jump in and show you kind of where those gaps are. For the 30% of you who are under 65 that are on private medical insurance, whether it's through a spouse, through your place of work, or whether you're on Medicare, there are four main gaps that Medicare and private insurance do not cover. And I want you to be aware of these because you can take advantage of what's available to you. You can prepare for this, but you just need to know because you don't want to go into a situation not knowing. Heart attack, cancer, and stroke, Medicare and private medical insurance do a phenomenal job at diagnosis and treatment of those conditions. What they don't pay for are the 60% of those related expenses related to the care after the fact. Transportation, comfort items such as anti-nausea medication, wigs, prosthetics, those type of things. That's not covered by Medicare or private insurance. It can be pretty burdensome. I live in Houston. I meet people all the time that are flying into Houston to go to the medical center down there to get the cancer care, experimental treatments, things like that. Medical transport. One thing I've noticed with Medicare, they do two things. They'll pay about 20% of that ambulance ride or that air ambulance, but they also have a review period. And that review period says, based on the procedure that you had or the treatment that you sought, you didn't really need an ambulance. You could have taken an Uber. You could have called your next door neighbor to take you to the hospital. And they'll say they deny the coverage altogether. So you really have to watch what Medicare pays for that medical transport because most providers of ambulance services, especially air ambulance, but ground ambulance too, do not prescribe to any Medicare pay schedule. They'll charge you more and you're responsible for that. We talked about any type of elder care. Medicare and private insurance is not designed for elder care. And then there's not any type of life insurance that's built into any one of these policies as well. So that's your, your gaps out there. Are there any questions? I want to make sure that you answer any questions for you. The good news is FREA and AMBA have solutions for you. You don't have to worry about the process. For those of you that are pre-Medicare eligible, we can walk you through that process individually. For those of you who are already on Medicare, we can review what your Medicare benefits are, what is and isn't covered, what maybe your supplement does and doesn't cover, help you fill any gaps if you have that as well. So if you've got questions, drop them into Q&A, hit up that chat feature. If you want to have someone one-on-one -on -one contact you via Zoom, phone, come out to your house, whatever you want to do, we're very sensitive to whatever you need. Simply open up your, your camera on your, your phone, hover over that QR code, a little box will pop up, hit it with your finger. You can check Medicare solutions or anything else you want to check on there. Comes back to me, we'll get Sam or Eric or Alexander to give you a shot, depending on where you live. If you're on your smartphone, you're on an iPad, and you don't have the ability to use that QR code, you can simply email me, john.green, j-o-n.green at amba.info. Please put in there your name, your phone number, and the county that you live in. That will help us find you and help us uh, put uh, the, the proper information out there for you there. So, all right, Jane, you brought up a great question. Jane asked, what about those of us on TRICARE for Life? Okay, super question. Pre-65, TRICARE for Life is your primary care for your medical. Post-65, Medicare becomes your primary. TRICARE becomes your Medicare supplement. So it's important to understand what becomes primary and what becomes supplemental. And if it, TRICARE has got networks that you have to go to, you still have to follow those things. You don't really need a true supplement. But just like Medicare supplements, TRICARE doesn't cover some of those rehabilitative, those non-skilled care, things like that as well. So great question on the, on the TRICARE for Life. We have a lot of military families that have that, and it's important to understand that. So. Uh, Edwin asked the same thing about TRICARE, how that fits in there. So important to understand TRICARE is phenomenal. Thank you for your service. Thank you for having that. Um, 
keep that. <laughs> don't lose that. Don't get rid of that. That takes place of that, that alphabet soup supplement that you have there once you turn 65. The biggest thing that I've noticed, because people have asked about, what about VA benefits for long-term care? How does that work? How do I worry about that? The VA benefits for long-term care are phenomenal. The challenge that we see is there's a waiting list. And sometimes you could be needing care for two years before you become eligible to come into a facility. So you've got to cover that time period in there. Who's going to take care of you during that period as well? So uh, super questions about TRICARE on that. Okay, Marie, Marty asked, I'm on Medicare Supplement F and have A, B, and D. If I switch to a new medicine versus the one I'm on, do I have a penalty when I switch to a new company? I think you're referring to a Part D type coverage. Oftentimes you can switch your Medicare supplement, keep your Part D where it is, and you don't have any type of penalty out there whatsoever. What it's important to look at with that Medicare, not the Medicare, the medicine coverage, the prescription coverage, different plans, and when I'm saying plans, different Part D plans have different formularies that they use for certain medications. So some plans have a much lower cost or a much lower situation um, for certain prescriptions. They sometimes will have the ability to go through like a bulk prescription provider and get you reduced cost that way. The one thing about your Part D, Marty, to, to understand, it is a calendar year change. So you really only want to make your plan D decision to be effective January 1st of next year. You can't really switch that mid-year, but uh, that's a good question in that regard. See if we got any other questions there. Talking about your meds. Okay, exactly. If you have a plan D that you like, by all means, stay with that. You don't have to switch to go to a supplement. We can look and see what the different plans out there. There are some websites that you can compare plan Ds all across the board plug in the medication you're on, and it will tell you this particular plan is better for you. Not only do you save money, but you save cost on the premium. So good questions out there. All right, I'm going to come back to this QR code and my email address as well a little bit. I want to tell you about some upcoming events. We've got next month protecting your nest egg. I hesitate always to look at the uh, stock market because I hate seeing all the red the past year. I want to make sure this stuff that I've worked for that 403B that you've saved up for, how do you protect that in the years that you need it? Then we're going to talk all about long-term care. We're going to touch a little bit on the uh, Medicare thing, but we're going to talk about what your long-term care options are, who needs it, what happens if you can't qualify for it, what do you do, how do you take care of that? And then right after Thanksgiving, we're going to talk about all of the cool discounts, all the fun, free stuff you get by being a member of FREA. So join us back for those. Be on the lookout. You should get emails from FREA. It's on their website. You can sign up for all of those things for you as well. But we need your ideas going forward for next year. Ann and Edwin and Harriet and I are building out ideas for next year. So tell us what you want to know about. Shoot me an email. Say, I want to learn about this topic next year. The whole aging in place concept, the, the, the conversation we had at the convention was from you. You said, hey, how do I stay at home and stay safe? People have brought us said, hey, what do I do with all my stuff once I pass away? Do I want to pass it on to my kids? Well, I can tell you, your kids probably don't want your stuff. So we're going to talk about how to declutter your home, how to avoid scams, what's a real phone call versus a scam phone call. Whatever you want to hear about, let Edwina, Harriet, Ann, and I build these webinars for you for 2023. So send me your emails, send me your ideas, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, people you used to work with, Tell them about FREA. Tell them about these webinar series. It's a great introduction. Not only do you get to hear about topics, you get to hear from Edwina. You get to hear from Harriet and Ann telling you what's going on latest legislatively, what you can be involved in. We put spotlight on certain units, highlight what they're doing, all the great work they're doing in their community. So I'm going to wrap it up here. Edwina, thank you very much for joining us. Harriet, thank you for joining us as well. Um, just make sure that if you've got questions, use that QR code. I'm going to leave it up. My email address is there. Send me your ideas. Tell me what you want to know about. Let me build a webinar for you. Do some research. Thank you so much for joining us. Edwina, thank you. You did a great job on your very first webinar. I appreciate thank you. that. You bet. So we look forward to seeing everyone in October. I'm going to sign off. If you've got anything, we'll hang around for a few more seconds. 
leave this QR code and stuff like that up as well. So have a great rest of your week, great rest of your Wednesday, and we'll talk to you then here in a month. Take care. John, thank you so very much. You've been great. You're welcome. Very informative. Everyone. You bet. So like I said, anything that anybody else wants, please send it our way. We want to make sure these are valuable for you. So everyone have a great day. Keep those hurricanes out in the Atlantic and let's not have anything before the end of the year. So take care, everyone. Prayers. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Edwina.